Everyone ready to, ready to get to our new series? You asked, you asked for it, and one of the major issues that a lot of people struggle with and you asked about was anxiety. And so today, I don't know about you, I don't like running from things. If you're running from things, you're always scared, you're always running. There's times to run and there's times to fight. But I want to encourage you, the best way to overcome obstacles in your life is not to run from them, it's to run to them. You see, I want to go after the dragons of our lives. So many times we run away from things. That's why we're calling it attacking anxiety. And today we're going to talk about how you and I can attack anxiety and beat anxiety. You don't have to live in an anxiety forever. So we'll be sharing about that today. And so that's what we're going to be doing. I just want to share a couple of things with you. Over 40 million adults, that's 19.1%, have an anxiety disorder in America today. That's according to the CDC. All right, and a matter of fact, not even that, but 32.3% reported anxiety and depression symptoms in 2023 alone. It is a significant issue in our culture today. And it's something that we hear about a lot. And I, I recognize that sometimes people, um, be careful of the extremes. You got people on, on, on polar opposites. On the extreme, they blame everything on anxiety. Oh, my anxiety. I can't go to school. Oh, my anxiety. And they always use that as an excuse, right? Oh, I can't do it because my anxiety. I've seen people like manipulate their parents with that. Oh, my anxiety. I can't go to school today. And the parents are being controlled by that or whatever. Or you have others that completely ignore it. Well, that's all in your mind. Just praise the Lord more. Put on k -Love. You know, quote a scripture. You know, and we'll get into that in a few moments. But I, I want to let you know that anxiety is real. And so we're going to look at how you and I can attack anxiety. And yes, we believe to have victory over anxiety because we believe that we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And also, worldwide anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness. I don't even like the word mental illness because it sounds like there's something like mentally wrong with you. I think it's more accurate to call it emotional issues, Right? Something in your brain is not working exactly correct at the moment. So what do we do about this? And how do we handle it? And so today we're going to look at it and see what the Word of God says and what Jesus, how he dealt with it himself. First of all, I want to say, anxiety is not a sin. It's a symptom. Anxiety is not a sin. It's a symptom. Okay, let me, let me explain a little bit to you about it. Um, for example, if I were to invite you to my home for, for Thanksgiving, okay, and my whole family's there, we have a beautiful turkey for Thanksgiving, we have veal parmesan, chicken parmesan, eggplant parmesan, <laughs> refried beans, empanadas, okay? It's amazing. It's an event, and not only that, but it's a beautiful day. We have amazing people that are there, your family, all your friends are there, right? And you go to that, and imagine before you go there, you have a stomach virus. Now, I know I don't want to say this at the second circuit, but you're literally vomiting. Okay, you're turning green. You got bile coming up. I mean, it's bad. You are sick. But for some reason or another, they drag you to this celebration. And all of a sudden, and, and you go, oh, I don't want to eat. What's wrong with you? This is amazing food. We cooked it all day for you. Look at all the families here. What's your problem? Come on, enjoy. Enjoy. You, come on. You need to grow up. Just sit down and eat the meal. Now, would you do that to someone out of stomach virus? First of all, you don't want an extra course on the table. <laughs> right? Another reason is you wouldn't do that. Why? Even though the food is amazing, even though the company is amazing, the person has a stomach virus and is sick, and you wouldn't yell at them for doing that. Yet we do that with people that suffer with emotional and physical anxiety and depression. Come on, knock yourself out of it. Come on. But when you're going through something like that, believe me, it's like you're a nauseous, it's like you want to throw up, and there's a great meal out there. And so I, I just want to encourage you. And sometimes the worst thing, the worst people in the world sometimes are Christians and not this. Where's your faith? It must be a demon. We blame it, we blame the devil for everything. Sometimes we, we live in a broken world and, and things will happen. So I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you. I can't stand it. They call them a pardon. I know it's a little negative, okay? Will you forgive me for being negative? You know what they call this? Idiot lights. <laughs> so 
What you do, they have no gauges and also beep, overheating and the, it's too late. The car's going to blow up. Run out of the car as fast as you can. It's going to blow up. So when this goes off, you know you're in trouble. I, can I just, I, what I want to do right now with you, listen, everybody, you know, sometimes we, we like to share things, but I want to be honest with you. I want to be transparent with you. I want to share with you uh, how back in 1993, one of these things went off in my life and steam was coming out and the whole car shut down. My whole life shut down. And let me just tell you a little bit what happened with this whole process. Gonna, if you don't mind if I just see here for a second, I just want to be, just to sit down and just to, why am I sitting down? Because I want to let you know that I'm not above anyone in this place. If not by the grace of God, I could not stand. But in 1993, I, uh, before that, in 1992, I broke up with my fiance, who I was engaged with for two and a half years. Okay, I had my whole life figured out. It fell apart. I was running from God. I, I, I checked myself. I was doing well then. Went into seminary. First year was really good, even though I was brokenhearted. It was okay. I took Greek, don't realize it, uh, had, had, a heavy, had a heavy schedule and all that, and, and uh, this was what's happening. It was my second year. As I was doing that, I was struggling. It was Thanksgiving, and I started doubting God in that summer. Uh, actually, the, the, first, after, okay, the first year was great. The second semester of, of seminary or cemetery, I was struggling. I began to see problems in the Bible. I began to doubt if God was really real. By the time the summer happened, I... I didn't even know I was going to hold on anymore. I was like, you know, I don't know if I believe. So it was the fall. I come home for Thanksgiving to be with my parents, and uh, they lived in Hamden at the time. I was sitting in the family room, and I, tell, I, I, I had, uh, are you ever going on a roller coaster? And you're, chick, 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 chick. you're like, my God, why am I on this thing? This is stupid, you know? And it's, chick, 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 chick. well, I started feeling like that, and there was no chicka, chicka, chicka going on. And I kept pushing it down, and, and I, told my, I told my brother, uh, who was there in the room, and then my dad, I said, man, for the last six months, I don't know, the last three months or so, I've been feeling like this, constantly have a knot in my stomach, like almost like I have Vicks Vapor Rub on my stomach, and there's no Vicks Vapor Rub. I, I've lost weight. I lost 30 pounds. I wish I could lose that 30 pounds now. Anyhow, lost some weight. I didn't have no desire to eat. I'm Italian. I like to eat. And I just was not doing well. And when I said that, my brother said to me, it sounds, like you're going, it sounds like you're losing your mind. You might be checked in someplace. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so he said, wow, you know, that one person we know, they went to a psych ward. And I heard that, and something happened. It, it, it spun me all around. My dad looked at me like it was something wrong with me. The whole room began to, literally, I felt like the whole room was coming in on me, like the entire room was like right here. And I felt my heart race, and I felt like someone threw me into a pool of liquid ice. Doesn't make any sense, liquid ice. But anyhow, I had ice going through my veins. I thought I was going to die. And I felt like God was nowhere, anywhere. My heart was beating. I was like, stop! And I didn't know what to do. And we were ignorant back in those days. We didn't know what to do. Almost like when you grew up and you didn't wear seatbelts. It's like, I had no idea what was going on with me. Now I know it was a panic attack. It was an anxiety attack. And no one seemed to know what was going on with me. And they thought I was fine. So I went up and woke up the next morning. And I, I, I felt this terror come upon me. And it kept coming back. It kept coming back. Well, what the heck is going on? And I thought, everybody, I thought I was losing my ever-loving mind. I thought I was going to go insane. And that scared me. So that made it worse. Well, you might have to be checked it. And so I faked it, and I said, I got out of there. I went back to school, and I avoided going home because home represented anxiety to me. I began to blame my parents for my upbringing and all those other stuff. I began to psychoanalyze. I wasn't getting any help, by the way. I didn't see a doctor, didn't see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I just, just manned up, quote, unquote. And, and, and so for the next year, I suffered. It was horrible. I wish someone would have told me, go see, a, go see a doctor, go see a counselor. You may be on, you have to be on medication or something. This is not normal. It's not normal when you've got three weeks and you have no relief and it's constantly on you. And so I had to walk through this horrible time. And let me tell you, I wanted to die. I wasn't suicidal, but I wanted to escape the pain. Maybe I can drive the car fast enough and just crash into something. I started, those thoughts were going through my mind. Maybe I could do, I don't want to hurt my family. I could do something to end this thing. I, swear, I, I mean, it wasn't like I was angry. I just, I just wanted out because I was in pain and I felt like a complete loser. I was ready to drop out of school. It was awful, everybody. 
But then through that whole process, thank God, I began to get help. I began to read the word. I began to get counsel. And, and now that was, that was 2003. It's 2024. And I learned some things. I don't have time to tell you the whole scenario, but I want to let you know you're not alone in this. You're not a bad person if you suffer with anxiety, uh, if you suffer with OCD or something like that. I think we've made excuses for people, but let me tell you something. What they had to do, you got to fight it. And I said, I'm not going to run from this. I'm going to run to it. Because when I was a kid, as I was afraid of something, I would, there's the high dive. Okay, I'm, if I'm scared of it, guess what I'm doing? I'm going off the high dive. So I started doing reckless things. <laughs> you know, I started facing my fears. I wanted to jump out of a plane. I wanted to do all these things to deal with fear. And so I had to face my fears. And in that process, my everybody, I learned a lot. I didn't believe in God. I thought God disappeared. I already had my doubts to begin with. Now I'm like, I'm sure he's not around. I pray I get nothing out of it. But I remember my dad's testimony when he was 16 years old. He had a vision of Jesus. And I knew my dad was not a liar. And that held me on. And I began the journey of getting help. I've never shared that publicly before in an environment like I shared personally because there's so much shame involved with this. You think you're a weak person. I used to think people are weak. Not a weak. Only the strong survive. That's what I used to think. Before, if I was down or depressed, ah, go for a run, have a, you know, have a milkshake or something or whatever. I'd be half a day, I'd be over it. But when it persists for not one week, two weeks, three weeks, and it continues on, and on and on, you can barely function. And what helped me, everybody, I just focused on my academics. I said, I gotta get through this. And that helped get me out of it. I did a lot of exercise. I exercised like crazy. That was also helpful. So, but I wanna share with you how Jesus got through it and how you and I can get through anxiety and what we're supposed to do with it. Are you guys ready to study a little bit of the word of God today? Okay, so I just wanted to be honest with you and share with you what happened in my life. So I like what Stephen, Dr. Stephen says, said this, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. In fact, do you realize ever since these came out, mental health problems have gone up? Now, the, the phones are not causing the problem. The people using the phones are the problem. And the company is like TikTok, Google, Facebook, Instagram. They have algorithms and they get in there, look at and you all day long you're like this. It's happened to me too. I mean, believe me, I get like turned to a drone like this. And what happens is you get socially isolated. You start comparing yourself to other people's. Other people are doing great. I used to hate going to parties. Oh, so what do you want to do for your living? Uh, I, I didn't want to talk about my future. And so now you're always at a party. People are asking how you're doing, right? Anxiety. So all this was going on in my life, and so we were not designed to live alone. We're not designed to be on these things. We have artificial community. We think we have community. We have a 1,000 friends, but no one knows. I mean, most people, most guys especially, we have nobody to talk to, zero. If I were to do a poll, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. How many guys in this room, if you were going through something horrific, is there any guy you could tell? And I'd venture to say most, of, most guys don't. Women, you, you got us bathe. It's not fair. Okay. So I, I want to share with you a little bit how we attack this situation. How do we attack anxiety? First of all, you can't run from anything and, and think you're going to get over it. Okay, the first thing is we have to understand how we're, how we're designed. Our first thing we're designed, we, we have nature. What does nature mean? Nature is you have DNA. You have chromosomes, okay? We're pre-wired for various things. We are. We're pre-wired for various things. And so our nature has nothing to do with anything. It's just the way you're wired. In fact, I was talking to a friend this past week who said that his, his, both his wife's family and his family had addiction problems involved with alcoholism and all that. And he told his kids, listen, guys, we have this in our family. Don't ever drink because we have a propensity for this in our, culture, in our family line. Sure enough, what happened? One of his children began to do drugs, went into a drug rehab program, tried every single drug in the book, had an overdose, almost died twice. Why? The DNA. Sometimes you got to pay attention to DNA. You do. You're not damned by DNA, but it's part of who you are. It's kind of the coding that we have already. Now, we can rewrite that coding to a certain degree. There's some ways you can do that. We're gonna, we'll get into another time. So you got your nature you got to deal with, right? That's just nature. Then you have another part of us. It's called nurture. Nurture is how you're raised. 
Maybe you're raised in a dysfunctional home. Maybe you're raised by an alcoholic dad or mom. Maybe you didn't know who your parents were. Maybe you were verbally abused, sexually abused, whatever. And that affects you as well, right? So you have nature or DNA. You have nurture how you're raised. Those are two ways. And there's a final one called pneuma, which would be spirit. So it's spirit. And so the spiritual aspect, there are demons, there are angels that are out there. And the enemy would try to do is the enemy tries to, we only get, we only power the enemy has is the power we give him. We let the enemy in with what we're thinking and what we're saying. So you can drive the enemy out of your life, but there's still excrement left behind by the enemy that gets into your thinking that we have to retrain our minds. And our whole culture is whacked. Have you noticed that? Our whole culture is whack. What's up is down. What, what, what's good is bad. What's beautiful is, is ugly. I mean, everything's messed up. So you get all that together. How do we get free of anxiety? How do we get free of depression? We're going to look at it today. Okay, first of all, anxiety is not a sin. It's a symptom. And you ready for this one? Jesus had anxiety. What? Yes. How do you know that? The Bible says so. It describes what he goes through as obvious, clinical. If you're, if you're a psychiatrist and you were to sit down and hear what Christ went through, oh yeah, oh, he's having a full-blown panic attack. Oh, he's depressed. How could you say that about Jesus? Because it's not a sin to deal with a symptom. Question is, who are you going to listen to? And so as we look at this, in Hebrews 11, uh, 4, 15 says this, for we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who was unable to sympathize, right, with our weakness says, Jesus understands what it's like. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Harmatio is the word for sin, which means missing the mark. So Jesus understands. He's been through what you've been through. He understands anxiety, and he especially understands separation anxiety. Some of you have dogs that get separation anxiety. They eat up the whole house, All right? And so Jesus was on the cross. You know what he said? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt the coldness of a godless moment. He felt all the weight of the world upon him at that very moment. More than all the scourging, more than all that he experienced, the separation anxiety from himself was the worst he'd ever felt. My God, my God. So Jesus understands what it feels like when you've been betrayed. He understands what it feels like to be scared. He understands what it feels like to go through anxiety attacks. Well, how do you know that? Well, let's look at it. In this passage of Scripture, before he went to the cross, Jesus fought the battle for the cross before the cross. And just to save a little time, what happened was Jesus, before he went to the cross, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which he often did. He went there, which is custom. He would go and he would what? He would pray. And he brought his disciples with him and he prayed out loud. How do you know that? Because they, they, they jotted his prayers down. Okay? And he came out and went and was his custom on the Mount of Olives. And he when he came to the place... He said to them, pray that you may not enter to temptation. And he brought his disciples. He left the, the most of the disciples behind, and he brought three with them. When Jesus was going through anxiety, he did not isolate. He got close to the Father, and he had his friends with him. Now, why did Jesus do that? He did that to show us a model. What do we do when we're depressed? We isolate, right? I'm not going to go to church today. I'm going to close the blinds. I'm going to just make everything dark. I'm going to keep my head down. You know, when we look at ourselves and we begin to ruminate, ruminate is like a cow that chews on its cud and, and swallows it and throws it back up and chews it again and, throw, and, and swallows it, throws it up again. That's what rumination is. You keep looking at yourself. Sometimes the best thing to do is to look up, get your eyes out of yourself. So Jesus brought his friends with him. He says, pray for me. When you're going through something, he prayed to the Father and he had people praying for him. And taking Peter, two sons of Zebedee, then he said to them, listen to this, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. He was under such anxiety and pressure, he thought he was going to drop dead right there. So Jesus knows what it feels like when someone says, I want a divorce, that feeling you have. He understands what it feels like when you lost everything. Here's Jesus experiencing the weight of the world at the point of death. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not as I will, but you will. What did he do? He humbled himself. I'm not going to listen to the screaming anxiety. I'm not going to listen to the fear. I'm going to bow down before my father and do whatever he says. Come hell or high water, I'm going to face the demons. And that's what he did. Now, how could he do that? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews later on, it says, um, it says Jesus faced the cross he, because he knew what was beyond the cross. In other words, Jesus knew what heaven was on its way. So he, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He understood what was coming. My friends, you and I have to get our eyes off of what's going on and need to look to your inheritance in Christ Jesus. Jesus won the divisive, the, the, the divisive and the, the decisive victory over hell. We have victory in Christ because Jesus was left alone. You and I never have to be left alone. The Bible says heaven and earth cannot separate us. Not angels, not demons, not any created thing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. We gotta believe that. We gotta stand on that and you gotta say, I know everything in my body is screaming he's gone, but he's not. I'm gonna continue to do the right thing. So, as he's praying, by the way, and he's, he's, he commits himself to God, the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And what happens? There appeared to him angels from heaven, strengthening him. But before that happened, and being in agony, you know what the word for agony in Greek is? Agony. <laughs> he prayed for more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down from the ground. Now we know from medical scientists and neurologists and, and basically when you have such great anxiety and we're talking, I've never done this. Have you guys ever sweat blood before? I've never sweat blood. I mean, I did break my, I mean, I had a my bloody nose one time, but I'm talking about sweating blood. He was under such great anxiety. What happens is your capillaries burst and it mixes in with your sweat glands and you have that cold sweat. He was sweating. There have been people that have experienced such great anxiety that they were sweating blood. Okay, now that's, that's what you call a massive panic attack. Do you understand that? Jesus understands what you're going through. So Jesus understood what that was. So what did he do? What are some ways he overcame this? Well, one thing he did, how did Jesus deal, how Jesus dealt with anxiety? He prayed to the Father. You see, everybody, we're gonna talk about it in a few moments. It's good to pray. Bring your petitions to God. I'm going through a hard time. God, I need help. Sometimes you're so weak, you can't even pray. And God's okay with that. What? Just like if you're at a party and you have a stomach virus and you can't enjoy the food. God's all right. I mean, would your mother be all right? My mother wouldn't. Okay. Seriously, if you're that sick and a stomach virus, uh, is a loving parent gonna be upset that you're not eating? Of course not. It's okay. Sometimes you're too weak to pray. I've been there. I've been there. To pray to the Father. Also, he called his friends to pray and to be with him. Don't do this alone. So in this story of Jesus going to the garden, we can see that he prayed to the Father. He had his friends close by. Okay? And he humbled himself. He killed pride. Now, I know Pastor Tom could probably agree with me and I'm ready to share. He's sitting in the back there. But we deal with people all the time that want to change their lives. But they refuse. They're like meatloaf. Remember last week we talked about meatloaf? I'll do anything for that, anything for love, but I won't do what? I won't do that. We always have that one caveat. And people say, I want to, I, I, I'll go on a drug rehab, but I can't do it right now because I need to bring food on the table for my family. Nope, you're not ready. You're not ready. I want, to, I want to save my marriage, but she, she's got to stop getting their last word. You're not ready? <laughs> the only time you can finally get true help is when you humble yourself. Pride is the first sin. It's the, it's the birth mother of all sins. It's the big ma. It's the big mother. Look what your neighbor said. Pride is the big mother. How dare you talk about my mother? Okay. <laughs> Anxiety, Right? Now, I want to show you, you have anxiety and you have pride. What do they have in common? I in the middle. I, 
I, I feel, I, my anxiety. No, the anxiety I'm battling right now. We make excuses, and what happens is we want to call the shots. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but your will be done. Why did Satan tempt Jesus? Says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you bow down before me, because he didn't want to take the hard road. Like you and I, he wants the easy path. It's easier just to divorce. It's easier just to let the person go. I don't want to go through all the fighting, right? I don't want to stop trying to, it's addiction. I'm going to give in to it. I, I, this, is my, this, is my, this is my identity. This is my sexual identity. I'm not going to fight against it. I'm not going to fight against purity. I'm not going to do this or the other. I, 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 I. It's all about I. You got to kill I to reach to the sky. I'm telling you. Anxiety. Anxiety is the, is the leash. I'm sorry. Pride is the leash on anxiety. That's what keeps you and I bound. It's the pride. So sometimes we think we're so, no. You have got to get to a place. And Pastor Tom will tell me, he works at their drug rehab center in New Haven. Until a person says, I have no more rights, until a person comes at the end of themselves, there's not much you can do. You're wasting your time. I've called people and they go, why'd you hang up with the person? They're not ready. Pastor, no, they're not ready. How do you know? I've been doing this long enough to know they're not ready, right? So God opposes the proud, but what? Gives grace to the humble. What's grace? Unmerited favor, power. Humble yourselves, therefore. Now listen to this. This is First Peter. And Peter was very prideful. And he fell into sin. He didn't want to. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Is God's hand mighty? Yes. So that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. God wants us to throw all of our anxieties on Jesus. Why? Because he what? He cares for you. Casting your anxieties. Tell God what you're going through. But you have to humble yourself. I can't help it right now. I got to do what's right. I, I can't report what I did to the company that I stole that money. Okay, you want to be healed of anxiety? You better report what you did. I'd rather be in prison and be free than be free and in prison to fear. Hello? Right? Maybe you, have a, maybe you have a sin that you have secret. Be wise about it, but why want to be held hostage by that? Get rid of your pride. And part of the reason I share with you today, I want to demonstrate to you that you think it's fun for me to go up to, oh, guys, I, used to, I had panic attacks in the past. You think I want to tell you that? But I want to model to you that the only way you get free is to take ownership so you can let something go. All right? So God opposes them, casting all of your anxieties on you because he cares for you. And the Bible says, be sober, mind, be watchful. Your adversary, devil, prize, prowls around like a lion. And so if he sees you're prideful, you give, him, you give him an open door. When you're humble, you shut the door on the enemy, okay? Now, I wanted to share with you Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Here's the antidote also how to help ourselves. It says the following. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, good luck. What? I'm saying. Anxiety is not my ruler. Anxiety does not define me. It might explain what I'm going through at the moment, but I am not an anxious person. I'm a person full of faith. And though I'm struggling, struggling stop saying my anxiety, my depression. How you doing? Well, my anxiety. Stop it. Yeah, you got anxiety. But this has been proven by neuroscientists. Whatever you look at and talk about, you'll drive towards. So stop talking about it. Okay, here's the problem. I'm going to drive toward a solution. When you're skiing, you don't look at the trees. If you look at the trees while you're skiing, you're going to, knock, you're going to hit the tree. What you've got to do when you ski is look through the open spaces. This is, not, this, is, this is science, and the Bible talked about it. Look for the solution, not the problem, and you'll start driving that. And here's another one. When you're getting freaking out, anxiety, you know what the best thing you can do? I've done this. Go smile and then breathe. You're doing new age. I'm not doing new age. My body's saying, hey, 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 emotions, it's all going to be okay. I'm telling you, if you breathe in deeply and, and smile and look up at God, say, God, thank you. I'm going to get over this. Thank you. Your, your grace is sufficient. Thank you. I'm never alone. You know what happens? It starts tamping it down. I'm telling you, it works. It works. Now, it's just to solve everything. It's a process, everybody. There's a process to get healed. Sometimes God heals like this, and sometimes you have to walk out your healing. So I want to show you something that I think a lot of us get into. Here's called the anti-Psalm 23. You guys ready? This was sent to me. I love it. I mean, I don't love it, but listen to this. 
I'm on my own. You know, the, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, here's the opposite. When you're negative. I'm on my own. No one looks out for me or protects me. I experience continual sense of need. Nothing's quite right. I'm always restless. I'm easily frustrated and often disappointed. It's a jungle. I feel overwhelmed. It's a desert. I'm thirsty. My soul feels broken, twisted, and stuck. I can't fix myself. I stumble down some dark paths. Still, I insist. I want to do what I want. This is what happens. Stop complaining. I want to do what I want. When I, when I want and how I want. But life's confusing. Why don't things ever really work out? I'm haunted by emptiness and futility. Shadows of death. I fear the big hurt and final loss. I spend my life protecting myself. Bad things can happen. I find no lasting comfort. I'm alone facing everything that could hurt me. Are my friends really friends? I can't really trust anyone. No one has my back. No one is really out for me except me. My cup is never quite full enough. I'm left empty. Surely disappointment follows me all the days of my life and I'll forever free, be free falling into a void. Wow. What do you do, everybody? You want to kill pride? Start saying what God says about you. Start saying what God says about you and I. So he prayed for the Father. He called his friends to pray. He humbled himself, and he focused on eternity. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. When you know where you're going, and you know this is not the end. Talk to a woman in labor. According to what I hear, I don't know if it's true or not, but you know the baby's coming. Once the baby's born, they forget about the pain. Is that true? Okay. Good thing I'm not a woman. God, I never have a child. I told you that we, <laughs> humanity would be extinct if men had babies. We're wimps. How can you confess that? Believe me. Okay. Focus on eternity. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. Close your eyes. Let me ask you a question. Do you, if you were to die today, do you absolutely know that you'd be with God in heaven? Do you absolutely know? You can know because Jesus paid the price for your sin. 